Hello everyone. In this video we are going to look at the concept of disaster preparedness and response. And this is our third lecture for nutrition in emergencies. Disaster preparedness refers to measures taken to prepare for and reduce the effects of disasters. And it involves prediction, prevention if possible, and then mitigation of the impact on vulnerable populations by helping them effectively cope with the consequences of a disaster. Disaster preparedness is a goal which is ongoing and is not a specialized program or stage that immediately precedes disaster response. What are the aims and objectives of disaster preparedness? The aim of disaster preparedness is to reduce the occurrence and severity of disasters and prepare the nation and communities so that they are able to cope with the effects of disasters. The objectives are to increase the efficiency, effectiveness and the impact of disaster emergency response mechanisms at the community and national level. To strengthen community-based disaster preparedness through national society programs for the community or through direct support of the community's own activity. To develop activities that are useful for both addressing everyday risks that communities face and for responding to disaster situations. How can we be able to achieve these objectives? At national level, this can be done by developing and regular testing of warning systems, which is linked to forecasting systems, and also planning for evacuation or other measures to be taken during a disaster alert period in order to minimize the potential loss of life and also physical damage. Education and training of officials and the population at risk. And also training of first aid and emergency response teams. Establishment of emergency response policies, standards, organizational arrangements and operational plans to be followed after a disaster. At the community level, we can do so by educating Preparing, that is the health and first aid, and supporting the local populations and communities by providing social welfare programs in their everyday efforts to reduce the risks and also prepare their own local response mechanisms to address disaster emergency situations. The components of disaster preparedness. These are the different stages that are involved in disaster preparedness and response. One is vulnerability assessment. And this is the starting point for planning and preparation. It is linked to longer term mitigation and development interventions, as well as disaster preparedness. Two is planning. Disaster preparedness plans are agreed upon and also placed in uh, order, which are achievable and also for which commitment and resources are relatively assured. Number three, Institutional frameworks are set. Well-coordinated disaster preparedness and response system at all levels with commitment from the relevant stakeholders. The roles and responsibilities of the different stakeholders are clearly defined in this stage. Four, we have information systems. Efficient and reliable systems for gathering and sharing information, for example, forecasts and warnings. Information on relevant capacities, role allocation and resources between the, the stakeholders. Then five is the resource base. You have to find out the goods, for example, the stockpiles of food, emergency shelter and other materials. The services, for example, search and rescue, medical services, engineering services, nutrition specialists and disaster relief funding. For example, for items that are not easily stockpiled or not anticipated, available and accessible. Number six is the warning systems. Robust communications systems. Here we have the technologies, infrastructure, the people, and this, all these have to be capable of transmitting warnings effectively to the people at risk. Seven is the response mechanisms. Established and familiar to disaster response agencies and disaster victims. This may include evacuation procedures and shelters, search and rescue teams, needs assessment teams, Activation of emergency lifeline facilities, reception centers, and shelters for displaced people. Eight, we have education and training. 
training courses, workshops, and extension programs for at-risk groups and disaster responders. The knowledge of risk and appropriate response is shared through public information and education systems. And finally, we have rehearsals. And this involves re evacuation and response procedures practiced, then evaluated, and then they're improved. So this, has, this is the brief summary of the components of disaster preparedness and response. Early warning and forecasting systems. Early warning systems have been around for a long time. Even in the ancient world, the ancient tribes observed the precursory signs of tsunamis in the ocean to warn their communities. Tribes in Africa watched the skies to warn about potentially catastrophic weather. However, with time these systems have evolved due to improved understanding of the natural hazards that trigger disasters and the deployment of improved sensors and means of communication to transmit the data to observatories. Early warning and forecasting systems. We have several organizations and ag agencies implementing early warning and forecasting systems. For example, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Agency for Technical Cooperation and Development, Femin Early Warning Systems Network, National Meteorological Authority, the Ministry of Health and the National Emergency Coordination and Operations Centers. International Early Warning and Forecasting Systems. Space agencies have also been set up and have set up applications to combine satellite imagery to generate relevant pro products that can be used in early warning systems around the world. For example, Global Drought Observatory, the European Flood Awareness System, and the Global Wildfire Information System. Standards, monitoring, evaluation, and accountability. Over the past decade, standards and improved monitoring and evaluation frameworks have been developed for humanitarian emergencies. Specific technical standards on food security and nutrition have been developed by the SPHERE project. Using these standards, the guidelines have been developed for the monitoring and evaluation of each of the main nutrition and nutrition-related interventions in emergencies. These agencies recognize the need to be accountable to their donors and to their agency mission statements or principles, and they are put in place systems to achieve this. In contrast, there is currently no incentive or obligation to be accountable to affected communities, other than a voluntary commitment to do so. And yet the close involvement of those who are affected by an emergency is a crucial aspect of the emergency response. Several initiatives, for example, the Humanitarian Accountability Partnership, have emerged to fill this gap. The SPHERE standards. The SPHERE philosophy is based on two core beliefs. One, people affected by disaster or conflict have the right to life with dignity and therefore the right to assistance. And two, all possible steps should be taken to alleviate human suffering arising out of disaster or conflict. So, the sphere standards have principles and foundations bind together. The principles, we have the protection principles and the core humanitarian charter. The humanitarian charter and the core humanitarian standard. And all these work together in order to achieve water supply, sanitation and hygiene promotion, food security and nutrition, shelter and settlement, and also health. And these are the standards on which they operate. The Humanitarian Charter. The cornerstone of the Sphere Handbook expresses the, sharing, the shared conviction of humanitarian actors that all people affected by crisis have a right to receive protection and assistance. And this right ensures the basic conditions for life with dignity. The four technical chapters include the minimum standards in key response factors. One, water supply, sanitation and hygiene promotion, and that is WASH. Then we have food security and nutrition, shelter and settlement, and also health. The code of conduct, we have 10 core principles on how human actors are supposed to behave 
in regards to providing relief and emergency response. One, the humanitarian imperative comes first. And number two, aid is given regardless of the race. There is no discrimination, regardless of the creed or nationality of the recipients, and without adverse distinction of any kind aid priorities are calculated on the basis of need alone. We base on need. We do not look at a person's race or creed or nationality in order to provide the response. Aid will not be used to further a particular political or religious standpoint. Neutrality is key. You're not supposed to take sides when you're carrying out emergency responses. Number four, we shall endeavor not to act as instruments of government foreign policy. And five, we shall respect culture and custom. Six, we shall attempt to build disaster response on local capacities. And seven, ways shall be found to involve program beneficiaries in the management of relief aid. Eight, relief aid must strive to reduce future vulnerabilities to disaster as well as meeting basic needs. Nine, we hold ourselves accountable to both those we seek to assist and those from whom we accept resources. And finally, in our information, publicity and advi advertising activities, we shall recognize disaster victims as dignified human beings, not hopeless objects. Dignity with respect and value. The proven interventions to prevent malnutrition. One, the nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive strategies. The nutrition-specific actions. We have feeding practices and behaviors. For example, encouraging exclusive breastfeeding up to six months of age and continued breastfeeding together with appropriate and nutritious food up to two years of age and beyond. The fortification of foods. Enabling access to nutrients through incorporating them into foods. And then micronutrient supplementation, direct provision of extra nutrients. And then the treatment of acute malnutrition. This enables persons with moderate or severe malnutrition to access effective treatment. Nutrition strategies. Agriculture, we have to make sure that nutritious food is more accessible to everyone. And also we have to support small farms as a source of income for women in families. Clean water and sanitation. These are key in improving access to reduce infection and disease. Education and employment. We have to make sure that children have the nutrition needed to learn and earn a decent income as adults. Healthcare. Access to services that enable women and children to be healthy. And then support for resilience. Establishing a stronger and healthier population with sustained endurance emergencies. The proven interventions to prevention of malnutrition. Promotion of exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and continued breastfeeding up to two years and beyond. These are some of the proven nutrition interventions in order to prevent malnutrition. Appropriate complementary feeding, which involves feeding children meals that are safe and diverse. The minimum acceptable diets. Here we have to put into account the minimum meal frequency plus the minimum diet diversity. The supplementation of vitamin A in children and iron and folic acid for women of reproductive age. Immunization and deworming. Promotion of maternal nutrition with emphasis on an adequate and balanced diet. Agrobiodiversity for diversified food production and use. Water, sanitation and hygiene, that is wash. Post-harvest handling, value addition and food quality assurance. Education and behavior change communication on healthy and safe food choices. Reduce consumption of sugary and highly processed foods and drinks. Reduce on fried foods and large portion sizes. Avoid alcoholism. Increase the consumption of clean and fresh foods. Increase the consumption of fruits, green vegetables and whole grains. And also improve food handling practices. The conventional community and public health nutrition strategies. One, you have to increase production and consumption of diverse nutritious foods through nutrition education and awareness creation, 
extension and sensitization on agriculture, biodiversity, food handling, post harvest and value addition, growth monitoring and promotion, facility and community based, through assessment of children's weight for age set scores, nutritional status monitoring and screening, education of mothers and caretakers, routine immunization and vitamin A supplementation. Three, micronutrient supplementation. Vitamin A is given to children every six months. Iron and folic acid to mothers in antenatal care and also adolescent girls. Food fortification, industrial fortification of food, biofortification, home-based or multiple micronutrient powders, and then other fast evolving strategies are also available, including food biotechnology and genetic engineering and modification. So these are some of the interventions in times of disasters and emergencies that can be uh, implemented in order to reduce the impact of the disaster. Thank you.